Good day, George. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Here I am sitting in the uh, beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina, and you are in China. You can tell us in a moment here exactly where in China you are. I think that's interesting. But for our audience, would you please introduce yourself, tell us your name, tell us where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied. And then we're going to get into your career progression to how you got to where you are today. So please. Sure. Uh, thank you, Guy. First of all, let me thank you very much for uh, for set up the interview. Uh, I'm right now, I'm at my home uh, and I live in Shanghai, China, the heart of Shanghai. So uh, we, we've gone through a lot, you know, the pandemic and stuff like that. And uh, so my name is George Li Minggu. My Chinese legal name is Li Minggu. And George is my alias I've been using and been know in the industry in the Western world. And uh, I grew, my hometown is Tianjin, uh, T-I-A-N-J-I-N, Tianjin. Is, uh, is, is not very well known what I found out, but it's a really, really large city. It's got just 19 million people. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the four municipalities in China. So so there's uh, Beijing, you, you got uh, Beijing, you got Shanghai, you got Tianjin, you got Chongqing. So there are four cities under the uh, uh, central government. So Tianjin is uh, next to, um, Tianjin and Beijing are very close, just like, 80 miles apart, you know, southeast part of Beijing. So if you locate Beijing and then next town is Tianjin. That's where I grew up and I went to Nankai University in that town, in that city. Uh, Nankai University is N-A-N-K-A-I, the two Chinese words, Nankai, meaning south open, uh, open to the south. Uh, that university was founded 1919. Last year it was centennial and it, centennial. So I went back to my alma mater and you know celebrated. That's a big, big gala because you know the the, the uh, university have started celebrating uh, two years ago. So set up all the all series events. Uh, that's where I grew up and I went to college. My my major there was English. Uh, let me say the right English, uh, British and uh, British and American literature, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> literature. <laughs> And uh, so we we, read, we we studied some of the you know poets and some sonnets and all of that and American and Canadian novels and great you know masters and in the masters and mistresses in the in the in the in the field and uh, very good uh, opportunity to get a systematic training in listening comprehension uh, in in composition in you know in all of that uh, you know do uh, reading. Um, uh, uh, oral English and also uh, uh, translation. So that's the five basic skills that uh, teachers do. That's the five basic skills. As an English major, I got a systematic training when, while I was very young, and I, I was lucky because at that time, college entrance uh, exam, I studied very hard to get through the college, like the SAT, you know, in America. Uh, the uh, admission admission in my city was like uh, 6%, 6 or 7 percent. So it was an elite education at that time, but later on it was like everybody goes to college. So and everybody got an, every university got an upgrade. So anyway, that's where that's why I am. So any well, thank have you. I missed anything? No, thank you so much for that. And now before we talk about your career after college and what you did, and I think there's perhaps maybe some more education in there. But let's talk about what you're doing right now today, and then we'll go in and fill in the gap between your initial college in, in China, and what you do f for a living right now. So tell us a little bit about uh, the consulting firm that you are that you are a part of and what your role is and the kinds of clients that you have and what you do for them. Right. Uh, uh, right now, um, I practice uh, performance improvement, uh, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> Uh, made it uh, make a living out of it, and uh, the performance, the our version of performance improvement is different than what we have. I have studied, you know, in in America, and you know, follow you guys. Uh, you, sir, you are one of them. <laughs> you are one of the persons that I followed, and met many other people as well. And uh, you are you are the you know earlier practitioners, and some of you are really pioneers in the field. Uh, and and uh, and and that's the truth. So. 
And uh, uh, but I, I came back to China like in 2005 and uh, trying to uh, uh, explore the Chinese way of performance improvement because I tried to install and borrow the American model, you know, the HPD model, you know, the 2004 HPD model, and you know, the gap and reason, I mean, root, root cause analysis, all of that, but it, it, it didn't very work very well. And then I thought, well, everything's different. I mean, the uh, Chinese, China, this is China, and this is uh, th th this is America. It's just the opposite. I mean, our names are different. In China, I'm called Gu Li Min. Uh, so, so ever since we have been, uh, we have been trying to develop our own model. So we set up the company uh, we, ten year, exactly ten years ago in 2011, my partner and I set up the company called uh, no, we developed the model called the GPS IE um, performance uh, measurement improvement system. So we set up the model, and uh, during the past ten years, we have been developing it and try to, you know, uh, go to the bottom of it, you know, uh, trying to penetrate and to provide the root solutions in management is not, is not only you know, performance. Uh, so we went uh, beyond, uh, above and beyond the old version of the performance improvement and trying to, 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 to solve the, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, oh, trying to solve the problems of, uh, you know, the chairmen and see the top executives of the Chinese companies because, uh, because that's very real, very real um, uh, problems. So that's what we have been doing. So we set up our company um, in 2014. To, that's seven, six, seven years ago, 2014. Uh, so Hui and I, Mr. Ding, uh, Hui Ding and, and I, uh, we are both the co-founders. So we're the co-creators of this model and we're the co-founders of Improvement Consulting. So our company is called Shanghai, the full name is Shanghai Management Improvement Consulting Company Limited. So we should the short shorten this improvement consulting. The 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 reason we call it improvement consulting is com is coming from performance improvement. So HPD. So so that's where we grew uh, we grew up, and that's where our professional home is, and and uh, that's where our new, we got all the many of the nutritions, and you know uh, we grew up from, from from there, and we established our own metabolism. And now we're we're growing up. We're we're still growing, and we're trying to uh, uh, either upgrade or, or 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 partially or 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 you know just uh, trying to enrich or the, the correct word to enrich the performance improvement methodology, the concept of measurement because uh, because you you know in this on this piece of land you, you use it and apply it to the companies with uh, with the top executives. Uh, it worked. It worked because we have tested for ten years. So that that's what we do. We do consulting projects. Uh, apart from consulting projects, we have uh, certification with ISPI. You know, we we, we partnered with ISPI. We did. Uh, we do uh, uh, called IPP International Performance Professional IPP uh, certification. Uh, you have to take the course and then do three weeks of work and with uh, six uh, six homeworks and with your real job or real job application and we have coach to coach you through the entire process and then uh, finally you have an evaluation if you pass great congrats you got a you know big shining certification uh, it's not a certificate certificate program it's a certification program so it's very complex and higher standard very strict and also the other is CID certified instructional designer and we only offer that on mainland China right now because it's such a huge, you know, 20, 30 million uh, training professionals need this kind of, uh, because I always say training is a science, uh, instruction is an art, because one is more subject, uh, uh, objective, the other part is subjective. So training is a science itself, and, but in China there's no such uh, a major in the universities at all. So it's very, very different in China. So there's no such a major, there's no, I mean, in the academia world, there's nobody training, training professionals for uh, training departments in the companies, only for, you know, middle school teachers and all that in, in the education system. And education and training are totally different fields. So that's what we do. Uh, apart from that, we also develop a software called Management Dashboard. 
the management dashboard is a software uh, right now is a prototype on the computer already and we're already installed starting to install to our, our customers that based on our methodology because in management what we found out is that uh, ma everything is algorithm management doesn't have to do anything doesn't have to do anything to do doesn't have to have anything to do with people because it's all algorithm on the behind uh, everything is algo everything is logic everything is business that's what we found the regularities of management so that really fits into the concept of the software and uh, because everything is kind of a, you know our, we'll put them into arithmetic uh, equations so mathematical re equations to to make it work so the regularities are there so gps ie uh in short is not an invention but rather a return a return so it's a it's basically a discovery we we discovered uh, something a way of doing management uh the way it should be you know there are many ways of doing things and maybe there's only very few or some that's the most efficient and effective probably this one is because we've been testing it for for 10 years and uh, many top executives agree with us so they, because they have been using it so that's what we do now Excellent. Thank you for that. So, uh, so you're you're doing consulting in China with top executives. You're helping them with management. You're helping other people get a certification in performance improvement. You're get, helping people get a certification in instructional design. So that's what you're doing now. And so you told us a little bit earlier that you went to school in China and you studied English. So what did you do in between? So we want to hear your origin story and the progression to where you are today. So I know you spent some time in the States, but I'm not sure because I don't know you all that well in terms of, so how did you get to where you're at? We know where you started. We know where you're at. Please fill in the gap there for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking. Everybody has their own stories and everybody has their long stories and short stories. My story is the same, you know, we cannot run along, but I just give you a quick, my kind of a type of a resume, my curriculum we tie in the short version, you know. So uh, after graduation, I graduated from Nankai University, English major in 1991, 1991. And then from there, I, I started work for a local company, it's a, actually it's a government company, you know, in China, they're you know, open from early 80s, early 80s, and opening up and reform from planned economy to mark socialistic market oriented economy, so on and so forth. And then our company was set up. Our boss, our chairman, is used to be a government official, like the vice mayor, you know, of, of our town, of our municipality. So he's very high ranking. He is the first one that he resigned from the government system and came out and set up a comp set up a business. Because in the 1950s and the 60s, he's been working in Hong Kong, you know, in China resources, he's been in Hong Kong. So he see what the capitalist world and how the, you know, the financial system. And so he set up the company in in 1981. So when I entered the entered the company, I was I it was it's exactly 10 years anniversary. So I I, I entered on the 10 years anniversary. And uh, so I was practicing, uh, I was doing import and exporting because that's where he started. That's his home base, you know. So he started there. And then at that time, when I entered, there are, there are already 88 branch subsidiaries, you know. Uh, it's a conglomerate like the Samsung group, like the Hyundai group, in, in, you know. So, and he's copying their model, you know. So, and uh, so a year later, a year only, uh, less than a year later, uh, l less than a year, uh, uh, I became his translator, uh, English translator, because I learned and I learned English. And uh, some of my earlier graduates from our department was his translator. And then they got you know promoted in the system. They took care of them, some some of the subsidiaries, and they need to promote new translators. So I with such an honor and I became his <laughs> translator. So doing, uh, so I did the importing and exporting business and, and part-time being his translator, English translator. He got Russian, he got Japanese and Korean and English translation. And English, I, I'm, I, I translated 
my translation work is the most because got you know English world and we we received you know the Walmart uh, chairman you know Sam Walton's uh, oldest son so I met him in two, in 1993 in Tianjin at that time Walmart has not entered Tianjin yet uh, entered China yet so so I worked there for like six years and then I came to America in, in the middle of it I you know studied TOEFL uh, GRE Oh, went through all that nine yards, you know, TOEFL, uh, TOEFL, test of English as a foreign, foreign language, you know, and then GRE test. And then, to, so I got admitted um, by the instructional design program in St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. <clears throat> uh, the reason I, I went to Minnesota is because uh, Nankai University and St. Cloud State are sister schools. They have a very good relationship. And, but the thing is, the funny thing, I didn't know that until later. I didn't know that. It's all kind of a top, on the top of officials. I was just, you know, I left my school already for a couple of years and I studied. Uh, the, the, the anecdote is the, uh, the, the, the accidental opportunity was because my academic advisor, Dr. Dennis Fields, I don't know if you heard about him or not. Dennis Fields, he, uh, he came to China for, on an academic visit for two weeks. So I went there and met him, and then he he introduced me to this program. We bre we befriended each other very quickly, and he said you should apply if you have interest in human resources. And at that time, I already did because I did a lot of work for like you know the interviewing work and translation work for our personnel department at that time. Anyway. So I got, I said, yeah, I, I mean, that was in 1993, 1993. So human resources still called personnel in China. And uh, so I came, but applying the visa, I spent, cost me a year. And, uh, and uh, so I came to St. Cloud State in the beginning of 1997. So in 1997, studied for two years, got my master's, and then I interned at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota. And also, uh, I also uh, interned at another uh, e-learning forum, and I interned at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota. And then I started in the in May of 1999. I started to work for then U.S. West, <laughs> U.S. West, and as an instructional designer. And uh, U.S. West later, uh, a year later, became Quest. Now it's CenturyLink, you know, that's, but that's a later story. So I worked there uh, for six years until 2005. I, uh, I saw the opportunity because I learned, you know, I learned uh, instructional design, e-learning, um, uh, instructional design, e-learning, performance improvement, consulting, performance consulting, all of that nine years. And I was very much involved with uh, ISPI, Minnesota chapter. And, uh, and I saw the opportunity, not so much with AISTD, then AISTD, because in Minnesota there's a, you know, there's a chapter for ISTD there. I attended some of their programs and also STC, STC Society for Technical Writing, Technical Communications. So, um, so at that time, it was in the early 2000s, you know, 2001, 2002, I, I met, you know, Bob Pike, oh, I met Bob Pike. In, in 1999, I took his course, and uh, in Ruth Clark, we invited her to uh, Minneapolis, uh, to the Twin Cities area for a national speaker event. That was in 2001, and, and at that time, I was the ISPI Minnesota chapter president. And I was a volunteer. I was a young kid, you know, international student. Two years later, I became the president. So it's a lot more work instead of. Uh, uh, and uh, and then in 2002 we invited Michael Allen, you know Michael Allen. The e-learning uh, was fantastic. The e-learning uh, demo there, and uh, so did a lot of that. Learn a lot, but you know every year 2001 I started back, you know to see my family, for my parents, and and started to see the two countries and the in the training and the performance improvement industry is like boom. Again, you know, just the opposite. And America is really advancing HPT, you know, CPT at that time, and a lot of certifications and recognizing the, the field. Um, the field is really marching and advancing, but in China, it's just like static, you know, and still like training. 
and it's like the training is like a, a trading companies like uh, 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 hey buddy you want you know what 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 do you want to hear what do you want to hear and here in my list of you know and get a lot of business cards and then they start to call them and sell so they buy low and sell high that's it so there's no major there's no professionalism there's I mean there's a lot of they're just trading training companies are basically trading companies <laughs> they sit buy low and sell high so I came back to China I had the soft lending I started to work for Hay Group Hay Group um, Hay Group you know the competency and you know uh, McLeland David McLeland and Ice Iceberg model um, so work for Hay Group uh, uh, involved in many consulting projects for a year and then after that year uh, I, I changed to Ericsson the Swiss uh, filmmaker Ericsson China Academy Ericsson China Academy from 2006 to 2008 uh, so a little bit more than two years a little bit shy to two and a half years and I was doing con consulting uh, training system consulting for them for two, two, uh, two years and four months maybe and then I, and then uh, IBM made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> so I moved down to uh, to uh, Shanghai, and uh, became uh, this is a country role is a uh, called knowledge and, and learning uh, 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 learning and, and knowledge leader uh, was basically their internal corporate university. So it's responsible for entire China training. Is called uh, this unit called this BU is called uh, um, Global Delivery Center. Global Delivery Center, you know, IBM uh, intake a lot of projects from clients, but they need an army of armies of engineers to do deliver them. And uh, some are recurring projects, and you have to do it year after year. And and uh, so yeah, I took that. Uh, I I was leading the training part training arm of, of China Global Delivery is a big branch, big branch. Uh, the biggest one is actually India, you know, in Bangalore, of course, you know, they got like three times bigger than, than what we are. We're based in China, the headquarters in Shanghai, but we got in Dalian, in Beijing, in Wuhan, in uh, in, in Shenzhen, in, uh, in, in Chengdu, so all, all around the country. We got like, at that time, 25,000 engineers only. But India got like 70,000 army of uh, engineers. So uh, worked there for three years, and then I I just left uh, IBM and uh, trying to because part of the reason I left IBM was because I met Mr. Ding <laughs> Hui, you know my my current partner. So we got to know each other. We bumped into each other in 2009. And we got to know each other, and then uh, later on, I found out what he's been doing is actually performance consulting. But uh, no, excuse me, uh, performance improvement. But he never knew it. So I introduced him. You know, this is what performance improvement is. This is what's called HPD. This is called ISPI. <laughs> you know, this is this. And so uh, at that time, um, we we spent days together. Just to, I, I, I'm kind of uh, updating, bringing him up the board. What what you have been doing is this and this. And he suddenly so. There's some variation ignited in in between us, and then we, uh, since then we started to work together in 2004, uh, 2011, a year after I left IBM, uh, I we co-created this model, GPS IE measurement system, measurement improvement system model, and 2014 we integrated all of our resources, uh, we closed all other companies, so we combined as we integrated uh, to create a synergy and uh, to just to focus on the Chinese way of improving business results for companies. So ever since, voila, here well, I am. <laughs> well, thank you for that story. That was excellent. And uh, it's, it's important to understand your progression uh, in uh, getting introduced to all of this and to utilizing this and that. What can you tell me about GPSIE and how it's different? You, you say you know things are different in China and it's the opposite. What can you share with us about what what some of that is? 
GPS IE, GPS dash IE, uh, we, we put a hyphen there, it's a hyphenated word because GPS everybody knows it, IE is Internet Explorer, everybody knows it. So it's, uh, it's like two guiding systems. One is global positioning guiding and geographical like guiding, the other is informational guiding. So this one is more uh, provide you just to follow the guidance of what management should be. GPS G stand for uh, G stand for, here you go, I got a book. <laughs> this is what, what the model looks like. All right, okay. excellent. Do you, do, you, do you see it in reverse or in the, in the right I, angle? I can see it fine. I, of course, I can't read it, so I'm at ah. a disadvantage. Well, there's English in there's English oh, wait a minute. It. Oh, I see it now. Goal, problem, 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 solution, implementation, evaluation. Yes, I see it now. Thank you. Problem one, that's level one, and level yes. two and level three. Level yes. one, level one is result. Yes. Level two are drivers. Yes. Level three are behaviors. Aha. Uh -huh. Level one, like, like, if our sales, we're, we're mom and pop grocery, you know, like uh, you and I, we are the two store owners. And if we want to, we're one sales team, we want to achieve, uh, this year we had 1 million sales. The next year we want to achieve 2 million. How do we do that? That's from 1 million to 2 million, that's level one problem. Okay, that's a, that's a result. And level two is how do we achieve it? So normally, you know, normally, you know, you will, uh, we, 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 both of us, we will be brainstorming and we'll say, maybe we need to, you know, get more new clients and we maybe we can visit more stores and see, maybe we can join a franchising uh, chain or we can, we, we need to do commercials. We need to go on internet and do more ads and, you know, we need to, you know, to the apartments, you know, to have some mail and send out some mail, you know, the American way of doing things and, you know, doing advertisements, you know, let more people know us, right? But why do we do that? Because we do that based on our feelings, our experiences, because my teacher, my master or, or my, my dad's generation, they've been doing that, you know, so and, and my MBA told me that or my education told me that. You know, and my boss used to, to do that a lot. But why do they do that? So they rely on their bosses or their father's experiences. But no one can tell why we do that. But actually, um, behind it is mathematics. So the turnover, the revenue turnover of our store, our store, you and I, our store, we need to set up a driver equation. You know, there's a mathematic equation there. So the revenue equals number of clients times the contracting time per client annually times the contract value, each contract value. That's the formula that we're looking at. And then you can still break down to six of them. So it's six, you know, the potential number of potential clients uh, times conversion rate, I mean, deal, deal rate, deal, deal rates because Potential clients are not clients. They're just phone numbers and names. You need to work with them to make them become your client. And then their total needs annually, their, their annual total needs times their collaboration rate because it's our store. They have annually, they have many needs to come to, to mom and pop store, uh, convenience store to buy something. Do they, how many times, like if every week, every week they have one time they have once to the one time need to come to the convenience store to consume how many throughout the year they, they should have like 52 times the needs right to go into convenience store but how many times they have they come to our store maybe they go 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 to Joe's store or maybe they go go to Brad's store you know somebody else somewhere else so as a collaboration if they come if they come in like 26 times their collaboration rate ratio with us is 50 so we need to re increase that. And then every time it's only one guy come in or, or his wife or his buddy or his friends or, you know, come in or, you know, their, their gals and, you know, young kids or friends and come in together. 
and every time each person the how much money they spend so those are the six we call drivers times each other equals to revenue so it's not those are called called approaches or tactics you know we we go online to to do advertisements and but we do that we do not know which number we're increasing so how about so that's level two and level three is analyze the actions that you need to take to increase the number of potential clients uh, conversion rate and uh, total needs and you know collaboration rate and help the number of people each time coming to the store and <coughs> everybody's spending we call it ARP, average revenue per user. Uh, average uh, revenue per user, up ARPU. Mm -hmm. So, so we need to find all those. And but each time, if six drivers, each one of them increase, not that much, just ten percent, just ten percent. So ten percent, one point one, six times of one point one is one point seven seven. So nearly one. So this year, next year, without averaging too much, we can achieve one million and seventy one point seven seven million easily. <laughs> if we increase twenty percent on each one of the six drivers, we will reach three million immediately next year. <laughs> if we yes. increase two times of those, that will be two six times of two, and that will be. 64 times of 1 million that will be 64 million next year so we'll increase from our our store revenue from immediately from 1 million to 64 million that's 64 times next year easily so performance yeah. improvement yeah. so we, we need to go back to what management should be so have designed for us so it's it's a discovery rather than an invention because we didn't invent it Maybe somebody, you know, supernatural beings invented it for existing for a long times, but we just didn't find it until now. So that's what GPSIE is. And then uh, P, P, P1, P2, P, P1, P2, P3, and that is, you know, as is, is you know, we, how do we increase those? And then we need to have tactics or approaches and working plans, uh, root cause analysis, all of that, everything in S. And then... Implementation is we use project management to uh, you know per, uh, to create the biggest and leverage the new facts you know for our work plan and evaluation is evaluate what result you know in the, there is a formative evaluation and summative evaluation which is very close to adding. <laughs> so you got a process in, uh, evaluation on each step and then you got a final uh, evaluation on the business results. 64 million. Yeah, that's that would be nice. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, that explanation. And so what I would like to do in my next question, and you, you've, you've told us this, I believe, but your first exposure to, you know, what some people call HPT, human performance technology, it's, all, it's known by many different names, uh, ASTD, before they became ATD, was calling it HPI, Human Performance Improvement. There's just performance technology, performance improvement, or other names, evidence-based practices for performance improvement. That goes on and on. But, but And they're, they're pretty much the same. There's people who have nuanced differences uh, in terms of uh, what that connotes to them. But can you, sh can you share with us, where was your first exposure to that thing, HPT, was it was it at Saint Cloud or did you come across this earlier? And and so so tell us about that first exposure. Sure, uh, it was first in Saint Cloud. Of course, it was Saint Cloud State. Uh, we had a course. We had a you know as a as a master student uh, as a master student. I we had many courses, and I believe it was in the third quarter or the fourth quarter. At that time, we were still the quarter system. You know. Uh, so I believe the end, at the end of the year, towards the third or the fourth quarter, I, rem I forgot, but I remember the, the instructor, uh, Professor uh, Chris Lacroix. Professor is a very uh, nice, uh, graceful gentlewoman, and she is a very, very nice person. And she uh, clearly taught, uh, she, I forgot which textbook we used, <laughs> 
but at that time, um, at that time, I, 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 I think we used this one as an introductory. I, I, I pull out this book. You probably recognize this book. I, I do uh, because I just was looking at it the other day, because that's <laughs> the book that in 1986 Joe Harless used the used the words. Analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. Nobody had abbreviated it to Addy at that point, but that's the that's the earliest reference I can find to that those words, those five words, and it's in that book in chapter one. George Geis wrote about that, but that's excellent that you have that because I just asked the uh, the leadership of ISPI, and you're on the board. Yes. You're on the board. And so I asked, can we reprint this book, that book in particular, because I, I think it, it, it's, it, it was very helpful to me when I first came across this. Uh, obviously, it was, it was uh, uh, produced in 86 and uh, released, and so that's when I would have seen it. But I have that copy of that book on my bookshelf as well. Yeah. Yes. Introduction to Performance Technology by ISPI. Yes. And of course, back when it first came out, that was back in the days of NSPI before the organization changed name. But so that's your so that was your exposure to performance technology or human performance technology. Yes, yes. By professor uh, was a was a, a master, one of the master uh, you know it's in curriculum it's in the curriculum. So we took that course a couple uh, three months maybe. Um, I was at that time. My I was totally lost. I mean, I don't. I didn't even know what performance improvement is. Sure. Uh, I was starting. I was still struggling to absorb the systematic thinking of you know chaos theory, of this theory, of that, and Addy, and all of that. So I was still struggling because my thinking was still the divergent Chinese way of thinking. You know, it's not like the linear type of, uh, of, of te fashion. So we, I need to convert myself. It's a very, uh, sometimes it's called painful but necessary process for me to go through because I was not brought up the Western style. And uh, even though I was taught, I was trained linguistically in, uh, in uh, I was trained linguistically in, uh, in, uh, at Nankai University. But the way of thinking, you know, is more kind of, you know, is is it's genetic. Sometimes it's built in. My parents told me, you know, so sure. so it was a painful process. And the way to collaborate with classmates and group, you know, uh, group members and uh, doing little projects. And I never did projects before. <laughs> school projects. It we call school assignments, not projects. You know, mm -hmm. and so the individualism clashes with collectivism and all of that. So is so, but. But this one is 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 on the uh, uh, in the middle of my uh, my in the process of my accepting in the real time the Western way of thinking uh, in uh, absorbing the Addy model uh, ISD uh, you know the Dick and Carey book and also the uh, Smith and Reagan book so I was in the process of learning those and trying to find out and. So it was a lot of to chew on this book. I mean, th this one is a later copy. It was not the original copy that I bought. And it uh, was a later copy because this one was too precious for me. So so I moved to so many times. And uh, one of the books I lost is this one. Uh, I, I never lose my books, you know. Uh, but this one, I really can't find it. It probably was, you know, by accident somewhere. But... Uh, was my first exposure to uh, by uh, uh, Professor Lacroix. At that time, I clearly remembered I did a class project uh, focusing on the analysis. This, at that time, was three W, three W: the workplace, the work, and the worker. And now it's four W. There's a world in front of it. <laughs> so thanks to Roger Kaufman. Yes, we're all looking at uh, Mega the world society at large and are we doing good for the world because you can improve things for the worker the workplace the 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 let's see what's the what's that third w stand for uh, it's, let's see oh the work so it's the worker work and workplace the organization level but we've got to look beyond just how we maximize the organization we've got to look and make sure that we're doing okay for the planet Earth because we only have one so far. 
Uh, but I, they, I, but, I, yeah. I, uh, I really admire Roger, and uh, he, he's one of the you know leading figures in this field. And he's very he started very early and uh, leading the this field in the directions. And uh, I I he and I are friends too. And I I, I, I told him that uh, the the mega is. Um, uh, oh, I, I, I sent him the one that I thought, you're, you're not a you know, performance improvement technologist, you're not in the professional, I mean, you're a, 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 a sociology, you know, a sociologist, something like that, you know, a social worker. Yes. <laughs> because he came down to the societal level, you know. <laughs> yes. I think uh, there's, a, there's a story about him in, in that uh, a group of seven of the gurus from NSPI, ISBI got together and at one point, they were talking about all their various methods and that. And one of them turned to Roger, turned to the rest of the group and said, Roger's the only one who gives a damn about my kids. Because you're all trying to maximize something else, and he's trying to improve the world. And I believe it was the late Claude Lineberry who said that to that group that was assembled. But anyway, so yes, we all va value Roger. So, so you told us that you'd been exposed to Bob Pike and Ruth Clark and Michael Allen. You learn the Hay model for compensation, which is competency based nowadays, because it used to be based on you know what size budgets a manager had back in the old days. Um, so you've had some very interesting experiences, and so to help others, perhaps people in China who are trying to climb the learning curve, or people in the United States, can you you've pointed out that book as a reference. So what other kinds of resources, people or articles or books, would you point some new people to because they were influential to you? And if you wanted to help people, you know, uh, come to grips with this, uh, become uh, to, you know, their journey towards mastery, what would you suggest for, for people that are entering the field of either instructional design or the broader field of performance improvement, what would you, what would you recommend? Okay, <clears throat> uh, the answer comes in two parts. First of all, for uh, instructional design, for the training world. The other part is for the performance world. Uh, first of all, the relation of these two is that uh, training belongs to performance, you know, improvement. We figured out that decades ago. And uh, I mean, the field figure, figure it out. So uh, to the instructional design or training professionals, I would say, you're asking me, give me, uh, give audience, I mean, our audience are in America worldwide. I mean, including China, America, right? So uh, to younger professionals, I would say, uh, keep learning, keep learning, keep reading. Nowadays, social media, they're so popular, you know, they're um, instant. Uh, some even crave for, you know, uh, 15 minutes of fame. That's not the way that uh, a, a, a true professional grow up. A true, really, the, the old, uh, old, good old way is still reading and practicing and uh, continue to evolve what you, you uh, lessons learn and from your uh, uh, successes that you achieved, you know, that's, you know, our generation, for generations being like that for thousands of years. So even social media is quick and fast and funny sometimes, but just, just for fun only. Uh, uh, there's deep, prof profound, and truly systematic thinking, really hard to be exposed or depicted through uh, quick and fast social media. But, but the connectivity is very important. Uh, I'm not saying that they're not important. They're very good. I'm using it every day. You know, I'm on Facebook. You and I are on Facebook. We're Facebook pals, too. Yes. So, and uh, um, so my advice to give them, the, one, is keep reading. And, uh, in the, in but the who? But who? But so point them to some specifics. So, you know, you, you may not be able to buy that perform Introduction to Performance Technology book anymore. But if they could find it, they should. They go to the yeah. library. Uh, yeah. But, what, but so people and books and that. So who, who do you think that they, that from an instructional design standpoint? I mean, you mentioned Dick and Carrie's book and. Yeah, yeah. those are the classics. Uh, Dick and Carrie, the system, uh, the system model, and uh, Smith and Reagan. Those are the classic books that you need to read and then uh, keep them on the bookshelf because they're going to accompany grow accompany you throughout your career for the next three decades. That's for sure. Uh, I've been doing that. You know, I've been moved. Well, I've been 
I am. I. I mean, I've moved so many times. I never lost that book. They're still here. I mean, they're mm -hmm. they're 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 my psychological basis. You know, <laughs> even I I don't use them every day or even every month. I know they're there. They're my food, uh, psychological food, professional food. Um, so. The other book I recommend is uh, uh, Robert Brinkhoff. Uh, Robert Brinkhoff is a very good scholar. He's, I believe he's in West Uni Western Michigan University, if I'm not I wrong. I think so. Yeah, uh, his book is called a High Impact Learning, H-I-L, High Impact Learning. That's a very different way of thinking. Uh, he, uh, you know, and Dick and Carrie talk about systematic thinking, um, but his thinking is, you know, Eddie model or uh, uh, ISD is too um, too lengthy, uh, you know. The but he provide the high, uh, the uh, simpler model, and also um, uh, in uh, nowadays in the in the in the in the new world, uh, uh, online learning is also a very very important trend. It's not a trend; it's a reality already. Uh, especially nowadays, you know, in the pandemic, everybody goes online. So Michael Allen is uh, Michael Allen is Robert Horton used to be a very good read because it, his book is tend to be the tool guide you know the 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 the, the, the tool book uh, Michael Allen's is is very good too so I, I would recommend and uh, most importantly most importantly above all and be, be uh, and before, be beyond all those recommendations, I have another recommendation that is Ruth Clark. Dr. Ruth Calvin Clark, her book, uh, her book is uh, she studied all the classic you know, uh, educational psychology. She studied uh, Ganes and you know the Kaufmans and so many masters and and, uh, and she combined she came out of those classic educational basis and created her own system. Her own system is more evidence-based. Actually, I heard the more of the term evidence-based from her books, you know, evidence-based based, uh, instructional graphics and, and, you know, graphic design or something, instructional design, something like that. And also uh, uh, building on experience. Those are the very, bu bu building on experience. Uh, those are the very good books. Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, she's retired a uh, long time ago, I believe, but uh, I, I met her in 2015 in Denver. Uh, she got the Lifetime Award from ATD, and last year uh, she came to New Orleans, and I was honorable. I mean, I was, it was such an honor. I was honor, uh, fortunate enough to present ISPI's Lifetime Award to Dr. Uh, Clark. So Ruth is really, I, I've been with a uh, friend with Ruth um, for many, many years. Um, we're not, not in constant, you know, pro, we're not even on projects, but she's one of the icons in Beacon Life that I really look up to. So her book is very, uh, her contribution in the field, I think, is that she converted many, uh, many classic theories and methodologies into very applicable uh, principles in the in the business world or in the modern organizations and very applicable. So it's a her book is a must read. So if you were then to shift into the broader uh, realm of performance improvement from instructional design, uh, do you have any recommendations, uh, people, articles, or books uh, on people who want to, you know, include that in their journey? Um, in the in the performance improvement world, uh, the book the amount of uh, uh, must reads um, is not as much as what we we should have in the in the in the you know ISD era. I mean uh, arena, uh, but the masterminds like you know um, the masterminds like. Um, um, Uh, business, BM, the the business engineering model, the BEM. Uh, that's a Gilbert's uh, behavior uh, engineering Gilbert, model. I, yeah, yeah, the Gilbert model. In the uh, and that's in the book Human Competence. 
Human confidence, yes. Uh, the uh, BEM is 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 one of the books, and also, um, except those masterpieces, I don't have any uh, other. I was. Can we cut this? Can we cut this period? Sure. Uh, yes. I'm looking. I'm looking for for uh, co uh, human confidence. That book. I got it. Yes. Tom Gilbert. That that's the book I think we're talking about, and also Michael Allen's Guide to E-Learning. Yes. Mm. Those are the two book two books, uh, but I want to also give uh, advice not on single books, but collection of articles and and books. Yes. And uh, those are here. They're they're all here. <coughs> can I bring them down and please, show you? Them? Please, yes. So we can. How do we resume the recording? Well, so so you're gonna you're going you were going to share with me uh, some of the uh, books or articles uh, that would be helpful to somebody starting out. Things that were influential you. to you. Sure. There's a lot of a big books. pile. <laughs> big books. They're very influential to me and. Uh, uh, I don't know if these books are they can find it or not. Like the these are the yes ISPR old you probably recognize all. Oh those, yes, right, right. right. Uh, Darlene Van Team's book there, uh, Performance Improvement Interventions with uh, James Mosley and um, oh I forget J James and uh, Joanne Joanne Joanne, Joanne uh, uh, Dessinger. Yes. Yeah, Unfortunately, Joan, Joan has departed, uh, has left us, but uh, um, oh, no. so rest in peace. But uh, yeah, that's a great book. That's a huge compilation of, uh, I mean, that's a fabulous uh, uh, encyclopedia almost of uh, the performance improvement world. My collection, uh, shall we, shall we, uh, are we recording now? Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah, my biggest collections are the encyclopedia type of uh, um, books, and I'm in love with those, with those books. Um, uh, uh, b before that, uh, this is a master read, and uh, in learning world, uh, Robert Reiser, Trends yes. and Issues in Strategic Design. Uh, Bob Reiser came to Shanghai twice or three times, and I met him and had lunch with him. Um, very, very nice person. Very nice friend. And the second time, he and his wife came, and and uh, we had a very good time together. So this one is a really book, very mm -hmm. good book. And this one actually actually has been translated into Chinese, I believe. And uh, e-learning. This is one of the earlier books. This is a new copy of an old book by Michael Allen. And I bought this in uh, Denver in ATD. Uh, ATD, you know, they have every time they have they set up a book bookstore, you know. So I, I ran into this one. Ah, I said, this is an old copy. So, and uh, as a trainer, as in the training world, you have to train, right? Bob Pike's, Bob Pike's book is a must. You know, mm -hmm. that classic book, you know, you have to be, be as a trainer, you have to do that. Yeah. And uh, in e-learning, I have another recommendation in e-learning is when we talk about e-learning, we cannot skip Mark Rosenberg. Mark, uh, I, I forgot what the top cover is. Uh, E-learning, uh, his name is E-learning, uh, Strategies for Delivering Knowledge in the Digital Age. This mm -hmm. is, I believe, a 2000, 2000 year 2001 uh, publication. Yeah, 2001 publication. Yes. Because he cited our US West um, EPSS system in, in, our, in, the, in the book. Uh -huh. EPSS book, EPSS, you know, Electronic Performance Support System. Yes. And uh, I, so I'm going to show you, these are my textbooks. Textbooks, Dick and Carey and Smith and Reagan. This is Dick and Carey and this is Smith and Reagan. Of course, this is the uh, upgraded version of Dick and Carey and uh, this is Reagan Smith. And of course, Dr. Ruth Clark's book, Collection of There. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I just I just mentioned that I'm so much in, in love with the encyclopedia type of books, and uh, so the here they are. These are the ASCD 
masterpieces. They are the, you know, the collection, you know, the, I call it the big break, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The big break. So they're both edited, editor is both, uh, editor is Elaine Beek. Elaine is my uh, good friend. Actually, she has been in this room. She has been in my study. And she's been in my home. I invited her uh, once or twice. And uh, so these are the two books. And guess what? They are in Chinese. I translated these two books. Look there. Oh, very <laughs> Let me good. show you. Yes. Took me a long time to translate. So these two are the same. So the, these are the pair. One is English, one is Chinese. So the thickness is the same, <laughs> <laughs> but we skipped the two chapters because one is a copyright chapter, the other one is not related to China. So mm -hmm. there are 56 chapters and then we got a Chinese version of 54, something like that. I, I forgot the exact number. And this one, this one is the ASD handbook for learning, uh, for uh, the ASD handbook. This is a newer version in 2000. 15, and I we published the Chinese version was got published in 2016. So let me find this one. Here you go. So one in Chinese, one in. So you can thickness everything. The probably the same. <laughs> Another brick. Another brick. So. It took me like five years to get these two books done. Uh, these are the this ones, and here are the ISPI publications. You probably recognize this three set. Yes, right. This three volume, right? So this is a team for three years. Tr took a team uh, to translate um, for three years to, to get it published. Mm -hmm. So the, this is the ISPI uh, Performance Improvements Guide. Mm -hmm. ISPI, you can see. Yes. ISPI performance guide. So, yep. um, so all these are the books that I recommend. And of course, before all of these are the uh, Robert Craig book of ASCD Developing Training Development Handbook. This is an old copy. If, if anybody can get this one, this is really kind of a classic and see what the training in the old world is, and but they made predictions to now. And of course, my love of this book is that uh, uh, Harold Stolovich and Erica Keeps, yes. they are the editors of this book. And uh, I, I know both of them, they are very good uh, editors as well. So Yes, and that's so the second the edition, and there's a first edition of that book, and then there's a third edition of that book, uh, of the HPT uh, Human Performance Technology Handbook. But, uh, yeah, so they're, and they're, they're, they're different, and so uh, all of those would be great. This, th this is the first version that I, I, I had, and I kept ever since. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the first version is, is really, really, way more than should have known. <laughs> There's a lot of it, but if you look into it, these type of encyclopedia type of tool books, they're, they're really like dictionaries. You know, they're like dictionaries you put on there. You don't probably don't use them every day, but when you run into problems, you go there and open it up and then find, you know, with your specific question from your work, from your uh, real work, and then the answer is there. Because 50 years ago, somebody in the same situation have done, been there, done that, and they have they have some answers, and that's a good reference for you. You know, and exactly. You, can, uh, you know, just go there. I mean, somebody been there, done that for you already. So don't pay, repay the price. Don't repay <laughs> the bill. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for that's that's an important point. Is that there's a lot from the past, and people coming into the business, they have to deal with the here and now. But they need to appreciate and understand that there is a long history of people applying this, learning from their successes, learning from their failures, and they have shared their stories and their approaches, which may can maybe perhaps can be adopted or slightly adapted or significantly adapted to that individual's current situation. But there's no need to, as you say, reinvent the wheel. No need at all. 
Let me let me shift gears here to the next question, and sure. uh, this is uh, to help share uh, models, uh, if you will, so that people can uh, either adopt them or adapt them. But the, the next question is: What is your thirty second elevator speech on what it is you currently do? So, how do you explain that if you are at a uh, social gathering? Or a professional gathering, and somebody comes up and says, "George, what do you do? What's your answer?" Uh, can we get? We can. We can start calm down. You can see. <laughs> you can tell me I can do it in fifty seconds. <laughs> well, I'm not going to time you, but but I am going to ask you to first do it in English and then do it in in Chinese. Really? Wow. Sure. Why not? Okay. Yeah. International sure. audience. I can, I can do that. Yeah. The elevator talk is. Um, the elevator pitch is that what I do. Okay, George, what do you do? I would say I do management consulting. We try to bring, uh, we try to help organizations back on track to what management should be done. And management actually is logic, is systematic, is result oriented, and is sustainable. Everything is paid by results. All right. Can you give us the uh, Chinese the version of it? Open. <laughs> so what's the Chinese uh, yeah, version? Yeah. Um, 我做, 呃, 我是做管理咨询, 管理咨询呢, 我们是发现了一种新的方法, 我们找到了管理的规律, 能够让企业进入到, 回归到管理的正轨, 使企业管理更加的系统化, 逻辑化, 结果性, and then the door opens. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's that's what the uh, that's what, I can can I upgrade what? my English answer? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, George. What do you do? Um, I do uh, management consulting. We found out the management regularities or the principles of management or the law of management, which is more which is very systematic, logical, result-oriented, and uh, sustainable. Everything in business, everything is algorithm, everything is logic, and everything is business. And now the door opens. Yes. Well, thank you for providing those examples. Uh, I think most of my audience should will be taking the English version and trying to uh, see what they can borrow from that. And of course, there's a much uh, uh, larger audience in China that hopefully they can begin to take this from you and learn and hopefully start helping to improve the four W's. Let me shift gears here again a little bit. And uh, you're a lifelong learner. You have, a, uh, you have multiple bookshelves full of books, but can you share with us what your current focus is what are you trying to learn right now? Uh, the uh, I, I have some books in the, in the, uh, like the theoretical physics. Is is not in the field. I'm an amateur. Yes, <laughs> I'm but that's fine. Amateur. Uh, Brian Green is a uh, Brian Green is a uh, as a very famous doctor, a Columbia doctor, a Columbia professor. He's uh, specializing in you know uh, uh, the radical physics, and uh, in you know people say the end of physics is mathematics. End of mathematics is philosophy. The end of philosophy is theology. So. <laughs> So, and what try, Brian trying to do, and also other masterpieces, I mean, like the Parallel World, all that. And uh, uh, Brian's book is Elegant Universe. He's trying to explain what, what, what are the 11th dimensions and what are the, you know, the, the dimensional world. You know, right now we're only in four dimensions, but actually the fifth dimension already exists and even 11 dimensions. So it's very theoretical. The string theory, um, the you know the 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 the, uh, the what's it called the the, uh, the quantum mechanics and 
I'm just a amateur. I'm not a mathematician, and because you have to really understand mathemat mathematics to uh, to understand them. But uh, it's a very popular, uh, of course, um, in Facebook and on the social media. I I read the, that guy, you know, that huge black guy, and uh, he's very popular as well. And the poet parallel world I just mentioned. That's a really good book. I I really like it. They're really really opens door to our existing world. The reason I'm interested in those is because I personally, from high school, I was very interested in phys physics, but I don't like chemistry, so I didn't go that way. I, I became, I studied English as an English major, <laughs> but I never dropped the physics as my kind of a instinct, you know, as a kind of a always craving for why is this happening? You know, like, why is this organization is like this? Why management is like that? So we're trying to find the regularities of this physical world. And what we found is there, there, there is a magic frequency in our world. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's, the word is called magic frequency. The magic frequency is that uh, you can create a resonance with that vibration. Uh, this, according to string theory, this world doesn't exist. It exists because of the vibration of those particles, the string theory. So we, we only exist in the time dimension only for 100 years, say, you know, uh, where, of course, we're physical being, we're existing in the three-dimensional world, and then we are existing in the fourth-dimensional world, but we don't exist on the fifth-dimensional world. Uh, so the entire world is composed, is because exists because of vibrations, such as the book. This one, this book, this is our book, The Logic of Management. This book is a paper made of paper. Maybe a hundred years later, it will, it will dissolve itself. You know, if we I left in the trash or somewhere in the ground, hundred maybe ten years later, it dissolve back into the 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 soil. So everything has a regularity. Everything has a fate or destiny. It's not serendipitous. It is what the supernatural being, the universe, has created for. Um, back on social activities, like managing a business, is also part of that regularity because we are in this unit where everybody is. So we have to comply. First of all, we need to know, we need to do is to really recognize, we know that regularity exists or that law of, of you know, management or law of doing things it exists. Secondly, we have to abide by it. We have to comply with it. Otherwise, we cannot succeed. But most of us don't recognize don't know they exist, and there's some, a lot of them they don't know they don't know, and then even they even they know or have some glimpse of that knowledge, and then they don't comply with it. That's why over 95 percent of all the startups they die, because they're not what we call the management frequencies, because in the natural world, a guy can they can use a goblet, you know the uh, wine glass, like, like the wine glass, and then you can just tap on it, and then they got it, it got you know the vibrating sound and beautiful sound, and then that guy can just um, uh, a voice a tone, pitch a tone, and then the same frequency, the same tone with it, and then he become loud, his voice become louder, his pitching become louder, and has a resonance with this one, so they vibrate together. At a certain point, this goblet will break. That's an uh, experiment on YouTube, and uh, that frequency is uh, 430, uh, 434 uh, hertz, 434 hertz, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> so it's called magic frequency. So some of the songs, some of the, uh, you know, music, musics are, or some, a lot of things, uh, some of the musicians realize that they did things like that, and some recovery, uh, you know, um, you know, health recovery, something like that. They're they're being applied for humans. You know, so those are type of things that we're trying to find. I'm more interested in because the law of doing things is already there. That's what I believe, and I call it management frequencies. Mm -hmm. Management frequencies. So we have to do things. the frequencies already there, like our heartbeat. You know, our heartbeat is also a vibration. You know, our blink of an eye, eye blinking, our breath, our, our we, we breathe and <clears throat> we do things and our pulse, everything is, you know, the, the pulse is there, the frequency is there. 
So when we start a business, at a certain point, you have to do that thing. At a certain point, you have to do this thing. You have to do this thing, and you have to do it right. So Peter Drucker, the great mastermind, told us, do the right things and do things right. But what are the right things? Who define it? Who, who def give a definition of the right things in management? So we have to, because, guy, you can have your own version of the right thing. I can have my own. Everybody can. A million people have a million version, million one version maybe, of the right thing. So, but mathematics has the right answers. So we have to rely, go back to mathematics to find the answers. That's why we call it measurement has the correct answers. So yes. that's what I'm trying to, you know, that's why I'm an amateur of, super fan of um, um, the radical physics. And I think this that's the dominating our, our physical world. And, uh, and uh, that's applicable to many, many arenas uh, in our in our lives. So yes. but anyhow, well, thank, <laughs> this is a short, thank, short well, question, but a long answer. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. No, that's that's very interesting, and I think that there will be people who find that intriguing, and hopefully they'll follow up uh, on that, uh, take a closer look at uh, what you're doing, and uh, see how all that fits. Let me shift gears again here. Um, the the next, uh, as somebody who's been uh, is a linguist, uh, this next question is about our language. So my question is, is there a favorite, or perhaps it's not really a favorite, perhaps it's a, an annoying performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Now, I've given everybody an opportunity to take a word or a phrase and say, it's, you know, perhaps it's being misused or misconstrued or, and they want to put their own spin, their own definition to it. Do you have a phrase or a term for us? I, I have many, I have many, but yes. I, I like to, this opportunity is, is a very, very good opportunity, but I, I would like to come up with my own. Yes, please. It's very short. Performance, it goes like this. Uh, performance improvement needs improvement. Yes. Can you t uh, tell us why you say that? Um, performance improvement really, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if I'm wrong, that it really took off in the 1990s, early 1990s, um, you know, with a lot of the masterminds and um, with the Rogers, you know, Roger Kaufman and Edison and Roger uh, Chevalier and with many others, of course. Um, and I've, fortunately enough, I was, I was very fortunate that not long after uh, this field started to take off, of course it was, was established in 1962. Um, so it has a great leap forward um, in, after it's changed its name in 1995 to ISPI, from NISPI to ISPI. And so two years later, I came to the United States and studied and uh, came across of course, it was in my curriculum, but long t over long time, what I what I've seen is there the advancement in the field um, is not that much. It's not that much. Uh, the advancement is by advancement I mean um, methodology, methodological breakthroughs, uh, the the um, the depths that we can the depths of problems that we can help organization with and the result that we can yield at an organizational level. And uh, so those, from those aspects, I think that uh, in recent years, we're, if we're not advancing, that means relativity, relatively that we're you know, withdrawing. So, um, so that's also, that's a fact, I think, that's a, not only a fact, but also a challenge facing our generation, uh, because uh, you guys probably retired and, and then you have done a lot of work, uh, laid the foundations, but it's up to our gen my generation, even younger generation, to come up with more new methodologies because uh, methodologies and way of doing things and, uh, you know, with the, so, so that we can create the, 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 the level of magnitude. Now we can bring real impact to organizations 
by organizations, uh, I mean by to the top executive, to the chairmen, to the CEOs, not to like training managers or functional leaders, because most of the time, uh, we only can cast our influences to functional leaders, and that's not, you know, what we should be going. Uh, I think as a performance performance improvement as in general after World War II, uh, after World War II that we evolved from you know ACT, ATD, uh, ASTD, and some other. Or we we I, NISPI exist created and uh, was born for the right reason, and we we have been in existence for the right reason, and we sh I think we should uh, exist. We should keep going for the right reason too. So that's why I say performance improvement needs improvement. We need methodolo uh, me uh, methodological breakthroughs, new inventions or new discoveries, new models, new way of things and doing things, new tools, uh, pragmatic, uh, being very applicable and pragmatic, and, uh, and also get young people into the field because uh, because we need new blood to keep on going. Uh, is we need new blood is not we need need the blood because the society needs it, organization needs it, uh, because you know what we are talking about the generation Y, the Gen Ys, you know, uh, or the Gen Zs. <laughs> now the you know the millennials start to come out to and they started working already. The millennials and they they were born in the 2000 and year 2000. They're now 20 now. So, times are flying, times are flying, and uh, we need to be more innovative, um, creative, and also um, do not rely on what the founders have laid for us and sleep on that, on our uh, heritages, but take those heritages as nutritions and energies and fuels and keep on going. Yes, thank you. And I think that those people that were our founders would have said the same thing because they were extending past practices and methodologies and such and trying to advance the field. So I, I, I agree with what you're saying here. We need to we need to improve performance improvement um, to continue to make advances and have impact. Let me shift gears again here. This is uh, we're getting close to the wrap up of our interview, but this last this uh, second to the last question is about uh, people who have influenced you. And what I'm really looking for here is some personal stories to help humanize some of these people. So you've met with Ruth Clark, and many, many, many people know of Ruth Clark, but they don't know her, uh, or uh, Michael Allen, or Bob Pike, or you know. But but so. If you have some sharing of stories, uh, uh, funny stories, serious stories, uh, efforts where you worked on with people or that you simply learned from them, if you could share any of that with us, uh, I would appreciate it. Uh, many of them. Uh, those are the great names uh, known to the field. Of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, Gary Rambler is, is also another one. But... Um, but there, all those, um, unfortunately, I never met uh, Tom Gilbert. Um, I, I was too late in the field. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, uh, Harold Stolowicz and Eric, those are really, I mean, all these masterminds are, I really respect them because that's the Chinese tradition, you know, to respect the, uh, respect seniorities. That's a, a, that's a Chinese uh, tradition. And, uh, but the really, Um, it's, uh, let me talk about my my advisor, <laughs> that is yes. Dr. Douglas Fields. He, he's really. <clears throat> he's, I just tell you a story, and then I'll end with uh, his retirement story. <clears throat> uh, when I was in his instructional design instructional design one class, he has two classes with us. And instructional design one, we used uh, Dick and Curry, and um, instructional design two, we used Mr. Reagan. So, uh, I mean the textbook. So in, in that uh, instructional design one, of course he told us you know how to do needs analysis, and we do we did a class project, and uh, and uh, we did a class project, and 
uh, our group was uh, our group. We chose 3M. We chose 3M, and 3M was you know great. You know, it's Minnesota, so we chose 3M. Somebody somebody else here, you know, General Mills and you know other companies, but we chose three. So it was four or five of us, and uh, so we did this, we did that, and and uh, we did uh, uh, needs analysis and. We research at that time. Internet access was very limited, so we did this, this, and that. But he was not satisfied with our needs analysis because our phase one is to need to write a needs analysis report. We did a needs analysis report. Well, of course, we downloaded their, you know, their, 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 their annual report and all of that. So, and I, I happen to know somebody who is going to retire from 3M. or collect all pieces together, and. Uh, after he reviewed, we, we, we handed in this week and next week when he had the club, when they have the course, he well gave us all the feedbacks, and and then is and then he said, uh, after he critiqued, I mean, give feedback on our needs analysis report, group report, and then he said in the perfect um, um, mail uh, the 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 you know the, the mail set, uh, the, the the tone in the classroom he said two words he said in doing analysis he said needs analysis he says never assume never assume and that two words kind of uh, imprinted into my brain until every day day and night never assume never assume you know what the customers' real needs are, what their situations are, you have to really go back and find what the gaps, real gaps are, what the truth are, what their business. And of course, over the years, my explanation and my understanding of his two words, you know, changes and sometimes goes deeper and deeper and deeper. As we, as I came into the business world, consulting and business management world, and my understanding is deeper. But his two words never assume. Never be subjective. That's really, really, um, like, um, is is my is in my mind's eye for all the time. <laughs> so that's that's the. So I I I taught to my I taught my students like these two words after we were done with phase one when I teach the Eddy model, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching uh, instructional design certificate program uh, for ATD in China for five years. For, Five, a little bit more than five years, so five and a half maybe, mm -hmm. and I did that for just like kind of a, just as a, help them, help help ITD to to get no in China. Of course, that course was the developer of that course is Dr. Ruth Clark, <laughs> yes, <clears throat> and uh, she uh, she had collaborated with ATD, and I'm teaching the I'm teaching in Chi Chinese version in. Of course, and then in 2005, when I met um, uh, Ruth in Denver, we had dinner and, and you know, we had my clients and, and her husband, we did together at the, you know, and then and, and she asked me, uh, I told her that I've been teaching, been teaching, she knows that I've been teaching her course in China, and she said, how did it go? I said, very well, and, uh, and I, I, I tell her that, uh, I'm teaching like uh, about 70% of is your original version. <laughs> I got 30% adaptation. She said she's thinking, she thinking that's very high. <laughs> <laughs> but I love her. Uh, instructional design is instructional design anywhere in the world. So it's a classic yeah. model anyway. So, so that's the uh, that's that's the uh, uh, anecdotes. But um, the real real inspiring story inspiring story is uh, actually from the retirement party of my advisor dr dennis fields so at dennis's uh dennis uh, retirement party was held in in the ballroom in uh in st john's university in uh, minnesota so you know everybody you know make fun of him you know <laughs> remembered him as a professor as a father as a good friend a colleague funny man and he did all this Halloween uh, pranks and all that so but uh, he gave us like a 10 minute speech and farewell speech to end his academia uh, 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 work career and at the end he thanked everybody and he thanked the leadership and the friends of, of family and friends and leadership and colleagues and students um, he has uh, he, he taught he had like 11 
certain design students from China, and each one of them are doing very well uh, right now, actually. And uh, um, so he ended his uh, uh, farewell speech like this. He borrowed a speech. He, he borrowed a poem, a poem from somebody I forgot. But you, you can look, we can look it up all the time. But it, the poem goes like this. He said, "Come to the edge. It's too high. Come to the edge." It's too dangerous. Come to the edge. We might fall. Come to the edge. So they came, and he pushed, and they flew. Very nice. Very nice. George, thank you so much for agreeing to participate with me in this video interview. Um, and my final question is for the our audience, for the new people in the audience that are just beginning to get into the field, what words of wisdom or guidance do you have for them as they begin their journey? Good old ways. Read and apply. Read and apply. It's a spiral. It's a spiral. It's not like two faces, read and apply. No, it's a spiral. It's like, you know, the the doctor... Um, uh, Cobra's, you know, learning, uh, learn, learning circle. So you have to learn, uh, uh, le uh, practice, and learn, and and and, and practice, and 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 upgrade yourself again. So based on your experience, uh, exper experiential learning, or just just read and, and learn, because we need to. Uh, there's no no other ways. There's not th that this this is the only way out. It's the only way up, actually. George, thank you so much for sharing your, your journey with us and your wisdom and insights. I wish you well and good luck in the future. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. And thank you so much for having me for this interview. I hope it helps. And um, thanks again.